As you all know, or at least most of you know, we've been on the last Sunday of every month, this um, September onward, having our spiritual family nights. And the topic we've been looking at during our spiritual family nights is developing a, a biblical worldview to live in a woke world. And we've looked at a number of different things. And this weekend um, with Pastor Clay here, I knew that some of the same topics would arise naturally in our discussions. And I figured there might be some questions that came to your mind, as well as just general questions that may come from the conference, what material that was presented. So I talked with Pastor Clay a couple weeks ago, he had not too long back. I, he didn't have too much head, head time or lead time on this, but I asked if he'd be willing to do a Q&A evening as our, our session tonight, and he said sure. He, he was very gracious to do that. I know many of you have given questions as the weekend has gone by, even this this morning, we had a few more questions delivered, so the rest of the time is going to be his. He's going to work his way through some of those questions as, as he can. Uh, we have roughly 45 minutes to however much longer we have snacks afterwards, so if we take three hours, the snacks can wait. It's okay, but we'll just kind of work our way through, and yeah, I know that he will guide us in some things and just answer a number of questions that you may have, at least maybe not answer, but help prod some of our thinking along the lines that we need to be to be thinking more biblically as we go about living in the world God's placed us in. Brother Clay. Well, we practiced this morning. Let's see how we do this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, so much better, so much better. It is a pleasure. You guys must have went home and practiced that, didn't you? It's just my way of really breaking the ice because I like for people to be relaxed. I like for people to be comfortable. Uh, I have a great deal of joy and fun uh, talking about the Word of God with the people of God. It's just, it's just how I'm wired and what I do. It's what I love to do. It's when I'm most alive. Uh, I'm not too good of a conversationalist just sitting around. Um, sometimes people wonder if I even talk. Uh, until I get behind the pulpit or get uh, a Bible in front of me or you're asking me something that has to do with biblical questions, then I can, I can go for a little while. And so uh, we just thank the Lord for his uh, great love. And I want to recognize your pastor and his wife. They have been gracious hosts, and we want to thank you on behalf of my wife and our church for having us here and being the kind, kind host that you have been. We have really felt welcome and at home here. So we thank you for that and appreciate that. Well, I don't know what questions you all have, but I do have some that were written. So I will try to answer or share something on those first, and then we'll take whatever questions you may have as a result of what we shared. Or uh, if you uh, come up with some theological questions, if I don't know, I'm not afraid to say I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Uh, I don't want to try to bluff my way through anything. Uh, but I have studied the Bible for quite a long time, and God has allowed me to learn quite a bit. So I will try to share as best I can uh, either the principles of Scripture or take you directly to a Scripture that can help you with the answer to the question that may be on your mind. Um, one question I have here, and the first one that I'll try to address, has to do with... Uh, and if I can summarize without reading the question, I might do that because you might know the person if I read the details of the question. And then I want you to snap your neck and break your neck looking around at people. So um, it is basically talking about someone who has offended uh, them and uh, a wife or a daughter who has seemed to made a turn, but the old memories are still there. And they're wondering how they should address that issue uh, based on the fact of what was done in the past. Um, well, I teach a class at seminary on conflict resolution um, uh, using the Peacemaker Ken Sandy book and the principles out of Peacemaker. And uh, you have several options if you find yourself in that situation. You can either choose to ignore the situation, overlook the situation. I don't, I mean, overlook is a better word. You can choose to overlook it or you can choose to go to the person in humility and share uh, what's on your heart and the hurt and the pain and knowing that they may respond properly or they may not respond properly. You just have to be willing to accept 
the lack of response, or you have to be willing to accept the repentance um, because they may confess, they may repent, and they may not. And some, there are some situations that it's just wiser to overlook. Okay? And this is why uh, being saturated with the Word of God and being led with the Holy Spirit is so important because there is no right answer to every situation. And, and that's why we need to be filled with the Word of God so we can be guided by the wisdom of God and that we can, are to be led by the Spirit so the Spirit can lead us because every situation is not the same. There are some situations, some sinful behaviors that people commit towards us that we just might just want to overlook. Uh, for example, many people always ask my wife and I, how do you handle people who look at you strangely and funny because you guys are not of the same uh, ethnic hue. And over the years, our response has always been, well, my response, she, she lets me do the talking when it comes to those situations, is uh, we just don't pay much attention to people. You know, we're sitting at a stoplight and you look at us and you look at us funny. Uh, I'm wise enough to know the light's gonna be green in a few minutes, I'll never see you again, so why, you know, lose any sleep over it? You know? And uh, one of the other things I've learned to tell myself so that I don't react funny is that, uh, well, none of them asked my permission to marry their spouse. Why do I feel like I need to have their permission to marry mine? That may sound sarcastic, but it's just very logical and that's the way my mind works. Why lose sleep over people you'll never ever see again? Some things you just need to overlook. Because if you go looking for problems, you'll surely find them. And so we just, you know, if you want to be friends with us, we'll be friends with you. You don't want to be friends with us. We're okay. Uh, we got each other. That's really all we need. Everything else is a blessing. We got our kids. They love us too. So, And so that's, that's just overlooking. But there are some situations that are a little more serious where it's, it's a sin. It's a grievous sin. And you can't really overlook the sin that needs to be dealt with. The Bible teaches us to, if, if, to go to one another, Matthew 18, and you got four steps there. You go to them one-on-one, -on -one, and if they don't respond, you take two or three witnesses. If they don't respond, and the two or three witnesses observe that you try to uh, reconcile with them, and they refuse to reconcile, then you bring it to the church, and that can be interpreted to the church leadership, or it could be interpreted to the whole church, depending on the situation. And if they don't respond to the church or to the leadership, then you have to do church discipline. So the Bible prescribes all kinds of ways. Uh, there are public sins, and public sins should be dealt with publicly, and private sins should be dealt with privately. There are sins as a pastor that people in our church has come, have come to me or come to the leadership and confess. We don't tell it to the whole church. If they've come and they confess and they're willing to repent and they're willing to go through whatever um, counseling that we're willing to set up for them to help them so they don't fall back into that, we don't go and spread that to the church. But if it's a public sin that everybody knows about, we have to deal with it publicly. And I've had both situations over the years. We had a guy uh, who was uh, on our pastoral staff, and he was working also at a Bible college in our area, and uh, he got caught embezzling some money and uh, the school was kind of slow to deal with it, but we weren't slow to deal with it. And uh, it came to a point where he wasn't willing to repent. He wasn't willing to do right. He uh, was kind, to, kind of bullying his family. And I had to uh, dismiss our visitors, our guests. We don't have visitors, we have guests. And I had to deal with that before the church. It was not a pleasant situation, but it was something that needed to be done because it had become public knowledge. Uh, and if you don't deal with things and it's public knowledge and people in the church are hearing about it, but you're not saying anything about it, everybody will come up with their own opinion about the situation. And then that hinders and breaks the unity of the body. It also scares people. Because if you do that with one, I don't want to get caught in sin because then they're going to put my stuff out on blast, so to speak, and put it out in front. I don't want, so there needs to be that kind of healthy fear to help us uh, to flee from the sin. So I hope that answers the question. If the person, if the Lord is leading you to go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, go to them one-on-one, -on -one, let them know the hurt, the pain, 
but be ready for them to either receive or reject. Or you could just overlook the situation since it's in the past and keep it moving. So hopefully, I hope that answers that question uh, in a summary kind of way. Another question is that it's, it's amazing that these are all people problems. If it wasn't for people, there would be no ministry. So it talks about a friend who um, belongs to the Alphabet Club, the LBGQs and all the other letters, and they are confused about their gender. And on three different occasions, they have criticized the person about their stance for righteousness and that there are only two genders. Uh, and made them feel bad for their stance and believing there's only two genders because they don't accept and um, come alongside of them and believing that there can be other genders. And the question is, how should you respond to that? What we need to understand as believers is that we're not responsible for people responding to the truth of the message that we give them. You have no control over their response. But what you do have control over is standing for righteousness and standing for what God says. And we have a responsibility to communicate that truth in a way of humility and love, realizing that we could be in that situation and then in some way, in a sinful way, we have been in that situation in the past and God has graciously approached us or sent someone to approach us. And so therefore we need to do the same thing when we find ourselves in those kind of situations with other people. We never compromise truth to be loving, but we should always be loving in explaining and sharing the truth. That makes sense to everybody. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can. No, we should always, we should, we must always tell the truth and we cannot compromise truth for love, but we should always be loving when we communicate the truth. And realize it takes time for truth to sink in sometimes. See, we, we've been saved so long we forgot that we didn't automatically do everything God says the first time we heard it either. And sometimes we're still not doing everything that God says when we hear it. But when it comes to other people, we want them to respond immediately because we want them to hear us immediately but how many times did God have to repeat things to us over and over again before we got it? But God never stops addressing the issue. The Holy Spirit never stops convicting you of the issue. The Word of God still never stops prompting you about the issue. But you do that if you love the individual. Sometimes it's hard, especially when it's people that you love and you care about, and it's family members, or it's mom, or it's dad, or it's your daughter, or your son. But you have to communicate the truth. You cannot adjust the truth based on who the person is or what the situation is. It's not situational truth. It's eternal truth. It never changes. And that's what, it can be hard when it's people that you love. It can be difficult when it's people that you love. But God loves us, but he always tells us the truth. Always. And he's patient and he's merciful and he's long suffering and he's kind and he's. But sometimes you get to a point when you have a rebellious spirit. He's not as patient. He's not as kind. He's not as slow to anger. And so in our church, I teach that um, Galatians chapter six, verse one says, if you see a brother or sister caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one, realizing that the next time it might be you. So I use this illustration of someone walking through a forest and they step in a bear trap. And I come along and I seek to release them from the bear trap because they're pleading and they're crying out for help and they want to be free. They don't want to be in the trap. They didn't intentionally walk into the trap. It just happened as they were walking through the forest, just like it happens as we walk through life. And it's my responsibility to try to free them from the trap and then take them somewhere to get the healing and the aid that they need so that healing can take place. But there are some people who get caught in the trap and you come along and want to help them. They talk about leave me alone. I'll figure it out for myself. I don't want your help. Well, that's rebellion. 
Rebellion is to be dealt with differently than someone who's caught in a trap, but they want to get free and they don't know how. The Old Testament says rebellion is equal with witchcraft. So you discipline rebellion, you disciple sin that people want to get free from. There's a difference. So we, play, we don't play with rebellion. We are very patient with people who need to be discipled out of their sin and out of their traps and out of their situations. And sometimes the church does injury to people because we don't realize and know the difference. So, did that answer that? Did that make it a little clearer? All right. So if the person has, has a lifestyle uh, that is contrary to God's uh, word, and that we can say that in any area. And I'm big on realizing, helping people realize that uh, we tend to, as conservatives and fundamentals, be very heavy, heavy-handed on homosexuality and lesbianism, but we are not as heavy-handed on adultery and fornication. It's all sexual sin. So I tend never to talk about homosexuality and the sinfulness of homosexuality and lesbianism without including fornication and adultery so that the homosexual and lesbian don't feel like I'm just beating up on them. I'm talking about all sexual immorality because we tend to make one sin worse than the other sin. And we just happen to know there are some people guilty of those other sins so we don't say as much as we do about the homosexual and lesbian. And you know from the newspapers and you know from Christian radio and you know from Christian articles that a lot of sexual immorality and sexual abuse has occurred in certain association convention that got swept under the carpet and now it's being discovered. And that's a terrible testimony to the world. That's a terrible testimony to those who have been abused but were shut up and shut down because the pastor happened to be some kind of celebrity in the convention or the association. That's an amen moment. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't, the sin is sin no matter who's doing it. From the pulpit to the back door, sin is sin. And whether you're a leader, whether you're not a leader, sin has to be dealt with because we serve a holy, holy, holy God, and you cannot compromise sin based on situation, circumstances, whether it's a family member or whether it's a leader in a church. Matter of fact, if you read 1 Timothy chapter 5, it talks about when an elder is sinning, and the ING is very important, he's sinning in a way where he won't repent. He doesn't get the four steps of Matthew 18, he gets two. Because leadership has more accountability. But we've been letting leaders go for far too long in certain areas, in certain groups, and it hinders our testimony to the world. It hinders the testimony to those people who have been abused by those leaders, but hushed up by the other people in the church. Mothers and fathers, there is not a pastor on God's green earth that you should hush sin up about and let your children suffer in silence. All right. Because what is done in the dark will soon, eventually, come to the light. And there are associations convention where that is happening right now. All right, uh, someone asked my opinion on mental health and using drugs to help counteract it. Uh, my church would tell you, don't ever ask Pastor Clay for his opinion because he tells you that he don't have one. And I try to stay away from my opinion because my opinion won't change anybody but the word of God will change people. So I try to direct people to the word of God. Now, we all know that Genesis chapter 3 changed things, correct? 
that before Genesis chapter 3, there was no mental health, there was no emotional health, there was no physical health issues, there were no spiritual health issues. But because of sin, everything began to be marred by sin and everything began to decay. So therefore, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health are realities because sin exists. Is everybody with me? Okay. But when it comes to those issues, we don't start with the physical, we go to the spiritual first. So I do not recommend that you go to the psychiatrist first before you've laid on God's couch first. Because if the issue is rebellion is against God, if the issue is sin against God that you have not dealt with and you have not repented, no psychologist, no psychiatry, no sociologist can help you with that. They can just treat the symptoms. They can't deal with the root cause. And I believe the word of God, according to the word of God, is sufficient for everything. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Psalms 19. Psalms 19, so that you see this is not just my opinion, that it has a foundation in Scripture. Psalms 19, starting with verse 7. After declaring, declaring the sovereignty of God and the glory of God, he comes to the word of God in verse 7 in Psalms 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord or judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. What the psalmist says there is that the God's word is sufficient for everything. So it's better to come and have a diagnostic system under the word of God before you go to the psychiatrist. Before you go tr take the medicine to treat symptoms, when your root cause it may be sin, or rebellion or disobedience. Now, once we've done the diagnostics and we've evaluated you and see that it's not sin, that it's not rebellion, that there may be a logistic, natural, physical issue, then we can recommend the other kind of help. Everybody with me? 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, you know it. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. It tells you what is right. It tells you when you're wrong. It tells you how to get right, and it tells you how to stay right. Let's start there first before we just jump in. You need a bunch of medicine because all the world can do is offer you medicine. Because they're just treating symptoms, they can't treat root cause. Because sometimes the news may come back that they can't do anything for you. And now you have to come back to the sovereignty and the power and the presence and providence of God because that's all you got to hold on to. So if you got to come back to the Bible, you might as well start with the Bible. And then if we find out that your life is in line with God's word, that it's not a sin issue, it's not a rebellion issue, it's not a disobedience issue, then we can go to the doctor because it might be a physical or it might be a mental issue. Because sometimes in our Bibles, some of it is a demonic issue. Whoa, that's a little too Pentecostal and charismatic. No, it's the Bible. Some people are demon-possessed. Um, some of my young adults asked me one time, Pastor, have you ever had to deal with demons? And I said, I, I think I can remember at least one incident where we had a young man who was coming to our church, and 
he had left his wife and he was staying in a hotel and I sent some men to go get him and they brought him to the church and we had a number of men in my office waiting for him. Um, and he came into my office and he looked directly at me and he says, we don't like being in the room with him. Notice the plural. He didn't say, I don't want to be in the room with him. He says, we don't want to be in the room with him. I said, this is something a little different here. And we began to read scripture. We began to pray. We began to call out to God on his behalf. Because we realized we weren't just dealing with something physical we were, and emotional. We were dealing with something that may be demonic here. And that's real. See, you got to stop watching TV. It's not just fiction. Demons and demonic possession is real. And some people are in the state that they're in because of that. And that's why we as leaders, just like any physician, have to know our trade well enough to be able to diagnose what the situation may be so we can prescribe the proper prescription. And that's where the wisdom of God comes in at. That's where experience comes in at. That's where the knowing the word comes in at so that you can know that you, how to properly treat these situations. So that's the process that I normally follow when I'm dealing with people. I don't always immediately recommend they run to the hospital or run to the doctor because they're just going to load you up with medicine. But the medicine only treats the symptoms. Let's start with the word of God first to see if there's any sin, any rebellion, any disobedience that's dominating your life. Are we dealing with possibly with some demon issues or demonic possession issues? And if we conclude that those are not the issues, then maybe you need to go to the doctor and let them do some work on you to see what might be wrong. Because it might be something that's caused by sin that is causing a, a, a decay or deformity in your mind or in your heart or in your soul or in your body. It makes sense. Okay. All right. Hopefully, I can read these, and, and the people that wrote them won't mind. Um, so much misunderstanding and mistreatment. Sin is a rooted in fear. As Christians conversing with each other, ethnic groups, what top fear should we be aware of generally? How can our thoughts and behavior ally those fears? Well, that's, that's a difficult question because uh, one of the problems is that you cannot make the assumptions that all ethnic groups think alike just because they're of the same ethnic group. Okay. Uh, I'm here to tell you all black people don't like watermelon and chicken. Sorry to bust your bubble. I'm here to tell you that all Hispanics don't ride 18 people in the car and they all don't have large families. Okay. There are some characteristics that have been ascribed to people that may be generally true, but they're not all true for everybody in that people group. So one of the things that I've taught people to do is just ask them. Just ask them. What is it that we as a particular group tend to do that you find offensive? Because the answer won't be the same for everybody. Because I'm here to tell you, I'm hard to offend. What offends other people who look like me doesn't bother me. Because I don't want to react in a way that doesn't give us a chance to have a conversation so that I can bring understanding to your life. But there are others who are not like me. You say the wrong thing, you might get a whole different person than you started the conversation with. There are some people who are offended. Now, there are certain things that you guys shouldn't do who are not of one persuasion or another. We had a young lady from our church who went to a predominantly Caucasian Bible college and uh, there were kids there who had never seen an African-American. I guess they don't watch television very much, but uh, they have never interacted with someone who was African-American, ever. 
Okay? And that's not difficult to understand when people live in rural towns. And so they were very curious about her hair. And they took it upon themselves to start touching her hair without her permission. And this young lady who's like my second daughter because she's our assistant pastor's daughter, she don't play that. And it was very hard for her at the school because of that. And I don't think everybody means to be offensive. They're just curious and they don't know the boundaries. They don't know the boundaries. But some people would find that very offensive. One of the questions, and I'll go ahead and answer it because it relates to this question. Do we call you blacks or do we call you African-Americans? I don't know. <laughs> some people would be offended if you call them African-Americans. Some people would be offended if you call them black. Some people would be offended if you call them anything but by their name. You got to find out what they find offensive. And this is why conversations are so important. Because one size doesn't fit all. All the general characteristics that these, these gurus come up with don't necessarily fit everybody in the category. So I've just learned to ask. Now, I have enough experience in my life, having been in you know, the inner city, having been in the, the suburbs, having been in the rural. When I grew up, I didn't think either side liked me. Because I got mistreated by people who looked like me, and I got mistreated by people who didn't like me. I got made fun of people who looked like me. I got made fun of by people who didn't look like me. So I learned very early in life just to judge each per individual as an individual and not a group. Just judge them as an individual. Because the shade really didn't make a difference to me. Because some were nice, some weren't so nice, and they all looked like me. On the other side of the coin, some were nice, and some weren't nice, and they didn't look like me. So I've just learned to judge people based on their individual selves, not pigeonhole everybody into a category because just one of you act up or may have said something that was offensive or hurt my feelings. And I think that's just the way we should do it. Stop putting people in categories and you don't even know who they are. Assuming and making assumptions about them that may not be true. Get to know them. Talk to them. Build a relationship with them. Have conversations with them. One of my most frustrating things, and you guys don't know my whole baseball story from college. Pastor knows we've talked about it was that what I went through in the racism during that time for my coach, none of my friends who were friends on the baseball team ever said a positive word of encouragement to me the whole time. They never came to me and said, coach is doing you wrong, it's not right. And these were supposed to be my friends. Matter of fact, the catcher on our baseball team in college was my best, one of my best friends in college. I was in his wedding. They never, ever said, this is not right. And that was probably more hurtful than what the coach was doing. Because you think these are your friends. Very lonely time. And all I had was the Lord, but he was enough. But it's part of what God takes you to to prepare you for he, where he's going to use you down the road. You don't know that at the time, but hindsight is 2020 vision. So when you see injustice, when you see wrong, when you see things that are not of God, say something. Because your silence says you agree with what's being done. That's an amen moment. Your silence says, I don't love you enough to tell them they're wrong because I don't want to lose what I have for you.
And that's really what some African Americans, that's all they want you to do is just say it's wrong. That it's wrong. And hold the other person accountable. But it's risky to do that. Because you might be called names that you don't want to be called. You might be called a lover. But as Christians, we should be willing to sacrifice ourselves for each other. Don't tell me you're willing to go and die a persecution for Christ on the cross and you won't die a persecution for your fellow brother or sister. Don't try that. Nobody's buying that except for you. And the same thing goes for people of my persuasion. When you see wrong, when you see your, uh, people who look like you treating someone who's of a different persuasion and holding them accountable for history, you should say that's wrong. It's not both and. It's, either, it's not both, either or. It's both and. Wrong is wrong. Sin is sin. Unrighteousness is unrighteousness. But we're so busy trying to protect our little world. So, you know, there, there are some things. Don't go touching people's hair without their permission. You're going to have to ask them which title they like best being identified with. Some people would say, just use my name. Why you got to talk about my race or my ethnic identification? My name is Bebe. Phoebe, that's my name. That's the name my mom and daddy gave me. How come, I, how come you just can't say brother or sister in Christ? Why has it got to be black or white or white or black? I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong, but why do we got to start there? Why can't we just say brother or sister? Friend, family, and countrymen, you know, something. But we've gotten into this mindset is where we have to identify you by your ethnicity first rather than your personhood, rather than our new identity in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul writes to the saints at Corinth and the saints at Ephesus. He doesn't write to the black folks at Corinth, the white folks at Corinth, the Jews at Corinth, It's the saints. We're saints. We're brothers and sisters, the brethren, the beloved. Those are the terms that Paul uses. Why can't we use those? All right. So I can't answer all the questions of what to do and not to do because people are different. There are some people you will call blacks and there are some you'll call African-Americans They'll be offended if you say African-American, but they wouldn't be offended if you say black. There are some that you'll say black, and then you'll say African-American, and they'll say, I've never been to Africa. I'm an American. I, I've never been to Africa. And they'll get all huffy and puffy about it. There are some who don't want you to call them Caucasians. They don't want you to call them white. Call them by their name. And then as church members, let's call each other brother and then beloved. Brother and sister. So th- those questions are hard to answer because it's just different in different pockets. You know, uh, I get to travel a lot, and it's different in the north than it is the south. You know, I remember I was at a men's conference um, in Tennessee, and I was preaching at a men's conference, and they were doing Q and A's. Q and A's are very dangerous. Because you never know what people are going to ask you. And then you got somebody like me, you never know what I'm going to say. And they were asking me about reparations. Now, I'm in the South. But you know me, I don't care. And so I said, well, um, what reparations did you pay Jesus for what he did to you? Did for you. And I said, when you get your reparations and you get your 40 acres and a mule, you got to give it to the Indians because they were here first. 
Why did I say that? <laughs> Guy in the audience said, you can't be saying that. You're a pastor. I said what I said, and I meant what I said. Jesus did not ask you to pay reparations for what he did for you on Calvary's cross. You don't owe me nothing. And you could just see faces turn and get all out of the line. And Lord have mercy, please don't mess with the icons of the civil rights movement. Listen, and I, I, I may get in trouble, but I'm used to that. I appreciate everything that Martin Luther King did. I have great respect for what he did and the stance he took against the injustice of that day. But what I also understand is what people did with that. And in the black church, and this is another question someone has, and I'll address this more, the state of the black church. What happened in the black church, because I grew up in a church where they had civil rights stuff all over the wall. They still do. They're still in the 60s. Okay. What had happen, has happened in the African-American church in many urban contexts is that the civil rights movement and civil rights became more important than the Great Commission. And here's the thing. There were people who were willing to suffer being beaten by policemen, having dogs sicked on them, having fire hoses turned on them, for something that was temporal, but would never do that for the advancement of the Great Commission. There's a problem with that. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, the reason we suffer in the Bible is for his namesake. It's because of the gospel message that the world hates. That's why we suffer. And if I'm willing to suffer for a movement, but I'm not willing to suffer for Christ, I have things backwards. I have things backwards. Now, y'all cool with that. There are certain places in the country that I go and say that. That's not cool. Because you're messing with, I'm not messing with the icon. I'm messing with the methodology. I'm questioning the priority of being willing to die for something that's temporal and not be willing to die and sacrifice what is eternal. That's what I'm questioning. Because you won't even go across the street to your neighbor to share the gospel, but you're willing to march up and down the street with people that the Bible says we shouldn't be yoked with because they don't serve the same God. I said that. Let me read the scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is why I don't join secular earthly movements. And I'll tell you why we join the movements here in a minute. Verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 reads this way. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us but you are restricted by your own affections. So it's not about God, it's about their own affections, their own desires, their own wants. Now in return for the same, I speak to you as children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't get in the same harness with them, don't partner with them to where if they go down, you go down with them because you're in the same yoke. If it's found out that their movement was false and they were really were just doing it to get money and people find out they were doing it to get money and you're yoked with them, they're not going to separate you as Christians from them. They're going to see you as one. Don't get in those kind of partnerships. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? None. What communion has light with darkness? None. 
What accord that, that has Christ with Belial? None. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? None. Now, the reason we join these movements is because we don't believe really doing it God's way will accomplish the same goal. So we join the movement. We don't believe if we go out and share the good news and make disciples that that will change the world. We got to join the agenda and try to change it civilly or through laws. When the Bible says laws just show you what's wrong with you, they can't fix what's wrong with you. See, the government understands something about you Christians. You don't drive in the spirit. That's why you need signs. That's why you need law. Because if you drove in the spirit, then the spirit would always lead you to do what the law requires. But since you don't always drive in the spirit, you need laws. So when next time you get pulled over speeding, don't make any other excuse that I wasn't driving in the spirit, Mr. Officer, please give me my ticket. Because if I had been driving in the spirit, I wouldn't have been violating the law. Because the spirit is always going to lead you to do what the law requires. That's an amen moment, by the way. The law can show you what's wrong with you, but the law can't fix what's wrong with you. Grace shows you what's wrong with you, but grace can fix what's wrong with you. That's why the new covenant is better than the old. Hello. And so I, I, I don't join movement. The church is the movement that I'm about. The gospel is what I'm about. And I believe the gospel and the word of God is sufficient to address every ill that sin creates. So why am I going to leave the best solution to go deal with solutions that don't work? We've been at this racial thing for 400 years and still haven't fixed it. But if I go make disciples of every nation and they get baptized and identified with Jesus Christ and I teach them to observe and obey everything God has told them to do, we can change the world overnight. Because you got more light shining in the darkness. But you can't get more darkness and get rid of darkness. All right. Another question, with today's emphasis on political correctness, do black people find it offensive to be called black by white people, or do they want white people to refer to them as African-Americans? We dealt with this already. I don't know. Everybody's different. People are offended by everything and anything except sin. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an idea how to fix this and how to do this and how to do that. So this is a hard question to answer because I don't know what to call us anymore. I'm sorry? Brown. My name is Clay. I don't know where you get brown from. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not African-American, I'm not black, I'm brown. I'm not brown, I'm caramel. I'm not caramel, I'm chocolate. I'm not chocolate, I'm Neapolitan. I'm not Neapolitan, I'm, where we at? Where we at, Baskin Robbins? What are we doing here? <laughs> we live in a confused world. But we should not be confused as God's people because our common identity, identity in Christ is really what defines us. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. And I'm just letting scriptures roll through my Rolodex in my mind here. Colossians chapter 3. 
starting with verse 1. If then, and really that should read since then, because it is a reality, it's not a question mark. You were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's good news. My life is hidden in Christ with God. And I was at a conference with Tony Evans. He did a great illustration. He took three envelopes or envelopes, depending on how you all pronounce it, what part of the country you're in. And he took the small envelope and said, this is you. And he took you and he stuck it in a medium-sized envelope and said, now you are in Christ. Then he took the medium-sized envelope and took it in a bigger envelope and said, you and Christ are in God. So how is the devil getting to you all the time when he got to go through God, Christ to get to you? We don't know who we are. We don't really understand what God has done. You're in Christ. Christ is in God. Satan has to go through all that to get to you. This world system has to go through all of that to get to you. But because we don't have our mindset in the right place, The worldly thinking trumps biblical authority. But he goes on to say, and I, verse 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the future. Therefore, as a result of this, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covenants, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So if we are in Christ related to salvation, we shouldn't still be practicing the things that God's wrath is going to come out against. Because that's not who we are any longer. That's not what we practice. This is why in all the epistle, Paul always starts with what God has done, how he has changed your position, how he has changed your identification. Now let me deal with your behavior. Because position should drive your behavior. We're trying to get people to practice something they may not be. And you'll be wasting your time because they have no ability to pull off the practice if they are not positioned right in Christ. He says in verse 7, in which you you yourselves once walked. Now, you don't need Greek. There's English people up in here. Isn't that past tense? But we talk like it's continual tense, don't we? He says, you once walked in this way, but you no longer walk the way you used to walk. You no longer live like you used to live because you are not what you used to be. By which you yourselves once walked when you were lived in them, but now you yourselves are to put off these anger, wrath, Malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. How do you have racism if you're putting that off? How do you have unforgiveness against people who are not treating you right if you're putting those things off? How do you treat people unjustly if you're putting those things off? How do you think more highly of yourself than you ought if you're putting those things off? How do you think low about other people who don't look like you if you're putting those things off? Verse 9, do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. That's Romans chapter 6. Sin has been made inoperative in your life. It no longer has any authority because of what Christ has done. And 
have put on the new man. I told you, you are not what you used to be. You put off, you have put off the old man by faith in Jesus Christ. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you put on the new man. You take off those old clothes and put on new clothes. You take off that old identity and you put on a new identity. And the two identities and the two war roles are nothing alike. But Pastor Clay, why do we still do those things? Because the old wardrobe and the master of the wardrobe and the owner of the old wardrobe, wardrobe still likes to come into your room and whisper to you, Psst, come over here and put this on. Your flesh is so used to wearing that, Psst, come over here and put this on. But what you got to do is remind them and remind yourself, that's not who I am anymore. So I don't have to listen to you anymore. See, sometimes it's good to biblically talk to yourself. I know people will think you're crazy if you talk to yourself, but sometimes you need to talk to yourself. And remind yourself of these realities and these truths. Because it's not automatic. That's why he tells you to put it off and you to put it on. You got to put it off. You got to put it on. God's not going to dress you. See, that's why Philippians chapter 2 says, it is God who works in you to will and do his good pleasure, but you must work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. God took it, did his part. You got to do your part. You got to work out what he worked in you at salvation. But we just want God to make us do right, right? See, you don't want sanctification, you want glorification, but you don't get glorification until you get to heaven. Here, you got to put off and put on. You got to resist, you got to submit, you got to surrender. I tell people in our church, and I tell people all the time, stop lying when y'all sing songs. If you don't really mean it, don't say it. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Why, why are we lying? Say I surrender some, that would be more truthful. Say I surrender when I feel like it, that would be more truthful. Don't say I surrender all. Yeah. So if you're not talking to a person who understands their new identity is in Christ, what you call them, you're risking how they may respond. That makes sense to everybody. All right. Because I understand who I am in Christ, you can't offend me with whatever term you use. If I didn't understand who I was in Christ, I'd be offensive by worldly definitions. But you can't define me by worldly terms because I am defined and you are defined by heavenly terms, not worldly terms. So you can't make me feel less than, you can't make me less than God's child. And if I'm God's child and I have equal co-inheritance with Jesus Christ, how are you going to make me feel less than? But see, we don't know who we are. So we let the world and Satan and our flesh define us. And so some of us think we are more than what we should think we are, and some of us end up thinking we're less than what we think we are. No, we learned this morning we are to think what soberly, be well balanced in our thinking. See yourself as God sees you. Talk about ungodly secular counsel regarding family or issues. Don't do it. God gave you a shepherd to go to. He did not give you a psychiatrist. God gave you a shepherd who is to watch out over your soul. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 17 says that the pastor will have to give an account for every soul. 
Y'all sure y'all want to be leaders in the church? I am your pastor. Every pastor has to give an account for every soul that has sat under their ministry from the time they began to the God, time God calls them home. And I've decided something. I ain't getting a spanking for you. <laughs> I'm not losing any of my rewards in heaven because I was too afraid to say to you the things I need to say to you. I have to give an account for you. See, there's a danger in being able to travel and speak to all these people. I have to give an account for everything I've said or I didn't say to everybody God allowed me to stand in front of. You sure you want to be on the circuit? <laughs> I, as a pastor, your pastor, all your teachers will have to give an account for every Sunday school lesson, every Wednesday night Bible study, everything they ever taught or didn't teach that they should have taught. And we're supposed to just let you do whatever you want to do? Think whatever you want to think? Go to whoever you want to go to? No. Not if we have to give an account. That psychiatrist is not going to give an account for you. He'll keep you coming in line on that couch for the rest of your life at $100 per hour and never have to give an account. So why do you think we should suggest you go to ungodly counselors rather than coming to God's counselors first? Are y'all feeling this? Y'all feeling this, right? Y'all feeling this, right? This is serious business. You're not just coming to church. And let me help my brother out. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, if a man cannot manage his own household well, don't put him in charge of anything in God's household. Now, every home is supposed to have a pastor. Mister, you are the pastor of your house at your local address. And if those three little four or five little people in your house are driving you crazy, imagine what this man is dealing with and having a whole flock to deal with. That means you men should understand what he's going through and you should be running to the church every day, say, Pastor, how can I help you? Because I can't handle what I got at home. I can't imagine how you handling all this. I just want to help you out, my brother. I just want to help you out. Pastors need help. You got three or four people at home and you don't have a clue how to help and deal with all the issues. Imagine. He got a whole congregation he's responsible for. And we can't find men in the church. Also thoughts about pastors not being highly regarded. Taking another pastor's advice over your own pastor's advice shouldn't be doing that. He is the shepherd of your soul. If you want to listen to another shepherd, go join that church. See, that's the problem in letting TV preachers be your pastor. When you get sick, they ain't come to see you. When you're hurting and dealing with problems, you can't get to them right away. But people have the nerve to come in and tell the pastor, I heard what you said, but so-and-so said, and I think what so-and-so said is better than what you said, then you need to go over and join so-and-so. Because he sounds like he's your shepherd and not me. You should never make your pastor feel like He's not the shepherd that's responsible for your soul. Because you will give an account to God for not 
listening to the shepherd of your soul. And sometimes you're running to the psychiatrist and sociologist for problems you can't fix because you've been disobeying God and God is the one causing your problems. And in Chronicles, the writer of Chronicles says, if God is your problem, then only God is your solution. See, that's why you got to do a diagnostic to find out what's really wrong. If God is your problem, because the text in Chronicles says God was causing their disturbance. It wasn't the devil. See, we blame the devil for stuff, and he down in the Bahamas sucking on a pina colada. He ain't even worth messing with you. You aren't even worth messing with. You ain't doing anything for the kingdom. You're not even a threat. But now God's got a problem because you're not a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And he was causing Israel's disturbance. And only God could solve what was disturbing them because God was really the one who was their problem. And that's why you got to come to your shepherd so you can get a proper diagnosis. So we can ask the right questions to see, is it this? No, is it this? No, is it this? No, is it this? Just like when you go to your physician. Is it this? Does it hurt here? No, does it hurt here? Stick out your tongue. We don't want you sticking out your tongue. But, you know, tap your knee to see where the problem is. Scripture does that also, according to Hebrews chapter 5. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going in, it cuts coming out. It cuts to heal, it cuts to remove. It opens you up and it fillets you open and it goes all down into the muscles and the bones and the marrow, showing the true intent of your heart because what we say and what we reject is not really all there is. Because our problem is really the inside out, not the outside in. So start with godly counsel before you seek ungodly counsel. By the way, just my logical mind, why would I go to a man who when he gets done taking care of all of his patients, got to go to his psychiatrist because he can't deal with his own problems? You know, most psychologists have psychiatrists. You know that? Now you know. Now, if he's going to be able to help me, but can't help himself, don't you think something's wrong with that? But a man of God who is being nurtured, equipped, healed, matured by the word of God can help other people. Another question, how diverse is your church? Well, of course, there's my wife and I, so that makes it automatically diverse. Uh, I would say we're about 60, 40, 60% African American, 40%, 30% Caucasian, probably 10% Hispanic. Um, But the other thing that we have in our church is that we have four other people groups who meet in our building. So on Sunday morning, we have service, but at the same time we're having service, there's a Nepali church having service in another part of the building because we have a large Nepali uh, group in our area. And so God over the years has sent different men who have a burden for reaching their people group because we didn't know how we were going to reach those people groups because Pastor Clay don't speak anything but English and that's a struggle. but we know we needed to reach the people groups in our area. God, what is your plan for us? So as we prayed about that as a leadership, as I prayed about that individually, God began to have people knock on our doors. Yeah, we're looking to start a a work in this area and we can't afford our own building. Is it possible we could use space here? Sure. We need your doctrinal statement. Got to make sure you're doctrinally aligned. But if you are, we'll open our doors to you. 
And over the years, we've been there since 2002 at the location we're at, nat, at now, we have helped uh, one Chin church that came in with about 50 people who grew to 120 people, and they grew so large they had to get their own building, and they moved out and bought their own building. We then got sent to Hispanic church, and they needed some space, and they got bigger, and they needed their own building, and they bought, moved out and moved their own building. And then we had a Nepali church that came, and they, they used space, and then God has just sent people. We don't even go looking for them. Can I tell you something really exciting? We have a group that meets in our building every third Tuesday <clears throat> called Wyandotte County Against Crime. They're not members of our church. They're a community group that uh, has a burden for dealing with safety in our neighborhood. And they need a space. And they asked if they could use our fellowship hall to hold their meetings every third Tuesday. And they've been there over 15 years. Now, they're not saved. Some of them are not even Christians. But they have an issue with crime, and we have an issue with crime. I live in the neighborhood. I need to know what's going on. And so through the sovereignty of God, this group have policemen who come and give reports about what's going on in the neighborhood. The mayor comes, uh, commissioners come, uh, the, uh, the assistant district attorney comes, the district attorney comes. I know everything that's going on in the community by going to one meeting. And these people who we're witnessing to, they're not saved yet, but they keep hanging around us, they'll get there, are good people, nice people. They're just not saved people. And these people have come in and done work in our church for us, stuff that needs fixed, because, you know, Pastor Clay don't fix anything, and I don't have a lot of people who can fix stuff. They come in and fix stuff for us just because they love us. They go to some of our single people's homes who they built relationship, and they'll go over to their house and fix stuff for them for free. And so now we have a reputation in the neighborhood if, and they go out, and if they hear about people who want to start a church that are of a different people group, they say, you need to go to 1916 Central Avenue. They do that all the time. So we're not necessarily doing diversity on a big scale in our local congregation, but we're doing diversity on a big scale by touching and reaching our neighborhood. And I do training with all these pastors at various times. Because many of them don't have Bible college or seminary education. So I get to train them and I get to build relationships with them and training them. We've had uh, marriages that we've been invited to. We've had births of babies we've been invited to by the Hispanic church and the Nepali church. We've been over to their house and we eat strange food. Which means I had to come out my comfort zone to build relationships. Because I'm not into strange food. I want to know where it is, what it is, what it came from, what it tastes like, because I ain't eating no monkey brains, I ain't eating no snakes and no alligators, no. My wife, she loves it. And our Nepali brothers, they don't know how to shut down the assembly line. It just keeps coming. But that's how they demonstrate love. That's how they build relationships. So I have to make adjustments and come out my comfort zone to build those relationships. That's what you have to do, too. So we go to their house for dinners. We go to their weddings. We go to babies' births. We go they, and the Hispanic church, they don't know how to do anything but celebrate. They celebrate everything. Graduations, births, marriages. The sun came up today. The moon came out tonight. They celebrate. And they invite us to partnership in those things with them sometimes. We're, we used to have, and we got to get back to having joint services every fifth Sunday. That is a sight to behold. 
all these four or five different people groups, different languages. We come together, have one service together. There's five screens set out across the sanctuary so that each person can see their language on the screen and the Bible translation and the hymn or the song that we're singing in their languages. It's a sight to behold. Hispanic church ladies tend to wear uh, scars over their head and cover their heads. So they went out and bought our ladies' scars, and now our ladies wear those scars when we come together and have joint services, so we kind of looking alike. Because that's how you build relationships. Some of the Nepali church went out and bought uh, clothes. There's like the clothes they wear that I don't normally wear. One of the pastors was in a house next door to us who pastors another Nepali church. His men all went out and bought these big, wide brim black hats. And he brings me one over just to say, we wanted to share this hat with you. I don't ever wear it, but it's in my office. But that's how they build relationships. That's how they say thank you. You got to figure out how God wants to be diverse in your area. It may not be everybody coming to your church. It may just be you opening your doors to other people who don't have the money to provide space, who have a burden to reach the people you can't reach. It may be you crossing the lines at your job and going to lunch or going to dinner or going to coffee or going over to their house or them over your house for a meal. Help me understand your culture. Help me understand the background where you come from. How did you get to America? You ask them some of the same questions. What is it that we as Europeans, Caucasians, do that may offend you? What are the misunderstandings we have about you that we need to clear up? What time we need to be done, Pastor? Okay. That's a dangerous thing with me. So diversity can look different in different ways just based on the context. One size does not fit all. That's one of the things I wrote about in my dissertation. It's not that everybody does the same thing. It may not be being diversified in your Sunday morning service, but everybody can do something to show love and unity towards people who don't look like them. How did you meet your wife? What brought you together? Uh Uh-oh. I try to make this shorter because it's, I met my wife in college. Um, She's an Iowa farm girl. I was uh, from St. Louis. I came to college to play baseball on a baseball scholarship. Um, I am five years older than my wife. Uh, I should have been graduated before she came to school, uh, but because of what happened with baseball uh, that affected some other areas, um, I uh, had to academically set out for a semester. Uh, I went and played ball for a while somewhere else uh, and then decided I want to go back to school and get my degree without telling you all the other dirty stuff. If you ask me personally, I'll share it with you. We don't have time now. Um, When I came back to school, I came back and my only focus was getting my degree. I didn't care about anything else. I didn't have time for anything else. I just wanted to get my degree and get out. And because of the academic situation, I took all the classes that I supposedly didn't do it well in the first time all over again, but all of a sudden now I'm an A and B student. I was brilliant overnight. Um, And uh, so I saw her walking across campus. Uh, Whether you believe it or not, I'm a very shy guy. And so I watched her for two years and never said anything to her. Just watched her. I was not lusting. I was watching. But my goal was to get out of school. Get that degree, because I was not going to let my baseball coach defeat me. I was going to get something out of this. And uh, I was going to get that degree. She dropped out of school because she contacted Mono. And so she was out of school a couple months before I graduated. But a friend of mine that I played basketball with uh, knew some of her friends, and we would hang out with them, and I would ask questions about her. Well, she came down uh, the week before graduation. I was due to graduate that weekend. 
It was finals week. And uh, her friend said, there's this guy who asks questions about you. You need to meet him. And through God's providence, I was upstairs because the hall resident who was a friend of mine was out of town. So he asked me to watch the dorm for him. That her friends worked at the switchboard, which was right next to his room. And uh, we were in the room and we were playing cards with a couple of my friends. And they came over and they were chit-chatting. Her friends introduced her to me. And long story short, we uh, liked each other. We got along with each other. Uh, I graduated that weekend. She went back to Iowa. She had a friend in Kansas City. She would come down and visit. A year later, we got married. That's how we met. But we should have never met. And if it had been up to me talking to her, we would have never met. Uh, and so, and uh, I kid her sometimes because there was uh, one Friday night, uh, a semester I think before that, where I was upstairs sitting in the main dorm and I was we were watching television and she came over and sat on the couch and was waiting for somebody. But she didn't know that I was into her that much at that time because I didn't say anything. And she didn't even remember who I was. <laughs> But God, through his providence and sovereignty, hooked us up. And uh, I graduated with a job offer in Kansas City. So I went home and got my stuff, moved to Kansas City. That's how I ended up in Kansas City. So it made the trip for her shorter to visit, or me to visit her shorter. Uh, and a year later, we got married. And we've been together 35 years next month. That's how it happened. She might give you a different story, but that's the story. Uh, how did diversity in churches become your ministry? It is an aspect of my ministry. It's not really my ministry. It's just an aspect of my ministry. And as I shared in the time in the seminars, really um, ethnic diversity has always been a heartbeat of mine. Um, my first best friend ever in elementary school was one of the only Caucasian guys in the whole school. And I would go to his house and spend time at his house after school. His dad would pick us up in an old Chevy. And, and the thing that I remember most, his mother would always have Twinkies ready for us when we got there. But he was my best friend in elementary school and all the way through elementary school until we left and moved to the suburbs. So for me, I've always been doing cross-cultural and ethnic ministry. But being in the high school I was in that was predominantly Caucasian until they started busing some other African-American students in, uh, going to a rural college, uh, I joined a predominantly Caucasian fraternity. Don't judge me. Uh, it was a fraternity that was based on sports and academics. It was not about partying because I was not a partier. I was not a drinker or a drugger or any of those things. It was athletics and sports and you just needed some fellowship because the church in town didn't make you feel very, very comfortable coming to the church. So I didn't want to go to church because they didn't really want you there. And um, also, being very strategic in how I think, I knew that I was going to get a business degree and I was going to have to work in the corporate world, so I wanted to understand how these people, how people think and how they act so that I could manage myself better in the corporate world. I had a plan. But God had a different plan also. Because most of the people I went to college with thought all blacks were either good athletes and dumb or all were like J.J. Walker on good times. Because many of them had never interacted with any blacks or African Americans up to that point because they mostly grew up on farms in rural areas. So in that fraternity, God gave me the privilege and the honor to change many of their perspectives. I remember one particular meeting that uh, they were fighting about something, and I don't remember exactly what it is, and uh, we were outside trying to calm down a couple of guys, and one of the guys made the comments, before I met you, I was as racist as the day was long. I thought all black people were this, that, that, and this. He says, but I, since I met you, you've changed my whole perspective. So that's why I say I've really been doing ethnic reconciliation for a long time. 
I don't do it just because my wife is Caucasian. I was doing it before I met her. Because some people, that's what they think. I've actually had that said. You're only concerned about ethnic reconciliation because your wife is white. You don't know me that well. I'm concerned about ethnic reconciliation because it's biblical. Because it's biblical. It's just been my life. I understand how the other people group drink thinks. I understand how my people group thinks. I know where the landmines are. I know where the dead bodies are buried. I know how to overcome the obstacles and the hurdles because it's just been my life. And so that's really how this all came about. I do try to preach about other things than ethnic reconciliation because I, I preach the Bible and I preach all of the Bible. But I'm often, to come, often asked to come to deal with these issues because God has just made it that way. Some of it's life, some of it's just by choice, and some of it's by divine calling. Okay. How, does, how do we as a church move towards unity and diversity on purpose? You do it on purpose. It must be intentional. There is no other answer I can give you other than that. You do it on purpose. You intentionally cross lines like Jesus did with the Samaritan woman because you see a lost soul, you don't see a Samaritan woman. And you send other people who don't see what you see and understand what you want to see, understand what you see off to Sychar to get some food so they don't get in the way of what you're trying to do. You do it intentionally. You do it on purpose. There's no other way to do it. You do it by fulfilling the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of what? Every ethnos, every ethnic group. And if we do that and you're winning people to Christ and they're coming followers of Christ and disciples, they got to go to church somewhere. And what better than to bring them to where you know they're going to get fed what they need to be fed to grow. Don't send them off to some church down the street where you don't know what they're going to get. We, we use this analogy in my church. We tell our congregation, you catch them, we'll clean them. You're fishers of men. We ain't sport fishing. We ain't catching folk and throwing them back in the pond. You catch them, we'll clean them. Because that's the Great Commission. That's what it is to be a fisher of men. Disciples didn't win people and send them to some other church. They followed right after them. Well, our church is not uh, conducive to, they won't like what we do. Then, Then the things you need to change, change. The things you need to keep the same, you keep the same. Which means you may have to come out your comfort zone with some of the things that you may not be used to, to reach all people. Well, they might not like the fact that we do this and do that. Well, do this and do that and add something else. That is not outside the word of God. See, you got to be willing to not assimilate people. And that's the old model we used to do use in, in, in mission work. And assimilate means you go and make people like you are. So we send people to third world countries. We want to change how they dress. We want to change how they do their hair. And we want to change. That ain't what God sent you over there for. See, if you get them changed on the inside and the word of God begins to change them inwardly, that will take care of the dress. That will take care of the things that are not in line with the word of God. But we made missions going about making everybody like us. And since most mission was European, making them like us mean making them act like white folk. Sorry to bust your bubble there, but that's what it meant. 
So we had the Native Americans cut their hair, dress in suits, wear ties, because we assimilated them, we didn't accommodate them. So accommodation says in, in, in diversity, you be who you are and we'll reflect you in the worship service, in the ministries, as long as it's not sinful. So that you see some of your cultural practices, you see some of your cultural identification in the worship service. That's the biblical model. I, I talk with college professors sometimes who are big on the Reformation, and I always challenge them with the question, why is the white right way the right way of doing everything? Where do you get that from? Show me that in the Bible. <gasps> show me. They can't show you. It's hard to find European people in the Bible. They're there. But not everybody's doing it that way. And that's what some of my African-American brothers have a problem with, is that it comes off like the white way is the only right way, religiously or biblically, to do anything. Where is that at? Why is it the only right way to do anything? All black stuff, all Asian stuff, all Korean stuff, all dark shade stuff is wrong? What scripture is that? Show me. I believe the Bible. If you can show me the Bible, I'm down with it. You can't show me that. So why don't we build ministries that reflect every culture that makes up the congregation? That is not sinful. See, I always have to say that because there are some cultural things that we can't accept in a church. We don't do much rap in our church. Very cultural for our community. But here's, I don't do rap for the reasons that some of my Caucasian brothers don't do rap. Here's why I don't do rap. I don't do rap because of the simple principle of communication. There must be a message. There must be a sender and there must be a receiver. If you send something I can't understand, there is no message. Therefore, it's got to go. But if you can send it, and I can understand the message of the gospel, and I can receive the truth of the gospel, I can work with that. I know I lost some of you right about there, but that's all right. That's all right. I will be on a plane tomorrow going back to my hometown. What is the general condition of the black church in America? And this is the last one I have on the card. It's not good. Uh, there's a great book by, um, I always get this name. It's an African name. And to, gosh, I shouldn't have brought it up. But there's a great book that is written about the state of the black church in America. It's called The Black Church, if you want to look it up. It's by and to TB, or I always get that name wrong. Uh, but it talks about the state of the black church, um, the theology, and it traces it from uh, early history all the way through the civil rights movement, all the way through the day, and it deals with all the full gospel and all that stuff and the word of faith and how that has impacted the theology and how we're all theologically in the black church, how it all tends to. Um, not everybody, but tends to focus on emotionalism and truth is secondary, if truth is even a part of it at all. Um, but I would say this on the other side to balance things out. My Caucasian brothers tend to be so academic, there's no emotion. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> and I think if they have all the right I's dotted and the right T's crossed and give all the right theological nuances, 
but you can have dead orthodox, orthodoxy. There's nothing wrong with having emotion in church. There's everything wrong with having emotionalism when there's no truth. See, there should be an emotional response to truth. Amen simply means what? Anybody know what amen means? So if you heard truth, you should be willing to say, so why do you have a problem saying amen? It helps the pastor to know you're paying attention. Now, I've been traveling in these circles long enough to know how people groups pay attention differently. You don't say amen, but I know enough that you're following and tracking me by the expression on your face and your body language. Because normally in this kind of setting, there's not a lot of amens, but people are tracking with you when they're bobbing their head. Or when they start to squirm in their seat when you deal with certain things. That's how I know you're getting it. Whether you are verbally responding or not. Now, in certain African-American churches and in, in the BFA and in our church, you'll get some who are very expressive. And you'll get some who are just like how you guys respond. And you learn how different cultures respond and are paying attention how they're acknowledging truth, how they're squirming because now you're in an area that's uncomfortable. Some are very intellectual, but you can see the mind and the eyes rolling. They're tracking. It's not verbal. It's not emotional. But we should not have a problem with emotions that are responding to truth. But when you have response and there's no truth, that's emotionalism and that's an improper response. God made you with emotions. And that's why I said in the seminar, sometimes the word of God has different effects. Sometimes you ought to be able to laugh because we're funny people. There are funny situations. We do funny things. There's sometimes when you just sit in silence because it just seems so heavy. There are times when you should cry. Shed some tears. One, because you're convicted. Two, because you see how good and great God is. Why is it we can respond to TV shows, but we can't respond to the word of God? My wife, I walked in the, day, the house the other day, and we were talking about this at lunch, and she's watching Little House on the Prairie, and tears are just rolling down her face. They are not even real characters. <laughs> but there's a response. Because she's moved. Why then when we come to church do we not allow people to be moved by the presence and by the power and by the promises of God? Why are we wrong? You're not wrong. You're wrong if the spirit is moving that way and you're grieving and quenching the spirit and not responding. I was sharing with you about the BFA, and my wife was asking me some questions about, should you have shared that? When I came into the association, if you had music you could bob your head to or tap your foot to, it was secular. Crazy me comes along and says, what scripture is that? Because I got scripture where people respond to truth. Now we have a big old mass choir at the banquet that sings to the glory of God. Y'all so tight, Jesus and John couldn't even get up in here. That's why I made that statement. We shouldn't be that tight. We shouldn't be that pharisaical. God made us with emotions and feelings, and we should respond to the truth of God with joy, with hand claps, with praise, with honor. 
with joy. Sometimes you cry. And sometimes it's so heavy and you're so convicted you want to hide up under the pew in embarrassment. It's an emotional roller coaster sometimes based on the truth that's being presented. And the black church has gotten too much into the emotionalism and there's no truth. But on the other side, we've got so academic, there's no response. Both are not good. And so, you know, as a result of the civil rights movement, I believe, and moving away from the gospel, we went into the full gospel Baptist movement. Some of you may be familiar with that, some may not be not, where it was a combination of the old traditional Baptist traditions, but we added the Pentecostal charismatic flair of the gifts. And they call it the full gospel because the old traditional Baptist didn't have all the gospel because you didn't have the gifts and excitement of the charismatic side. And a lot of the younger generation left the old traditional church and flocked to that. And then you had the word of faith and all these new things that have come out. And now we have progressive Christianity dominating where there's no truth and we rewrite the Bible and nothing is true. And but that's ha what happens when you drift away from the foundational things. So that's kind of where the black church is. Uh, it's become more social oriented. See, the Bible, the, you don't have an adjective on justice in the Bible. Justice is just justice. It's not social, it's not political, it's not, it's just justice. And we should be, be concerned about justice because God is concerned about justice. We should say that abuse is wrong. We should say when the police department is wrong, but don't be accusing the police department and you ain't praying for their salvation at the same time. Because we have a command as a people of God in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for governing authorities. We want to talk about them. We don't want to pray for them. They need salvation. They need to know Christ. They're lost in sin, shaped in iniquity by their very nature, people of wrath. Some of them are even demon possessed. There is no march, there is no protest, there is no slander you can bring against them that will fix that. Only the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And if we don't do it, there is no other option, brothers and sisters. If we get into the slandering and the accusation and the, who's doing the praying? Who's interceding before them on before God on their behalf. I'm not saying what they're doing is right. I'm just saying you got to know what the right solution is to that problem. I think that's it. Are there any other questions? That's a, that's a lot to chew on. Okay. Well, let me dismiss. Thank you all so much for allowing me to come here. Pastor, thank you once again for allowing us to come here. I hope we've been helpful. If nothing else, I hope we caused you to think. To think. Father, we just thank you so much. You know, I don't believe that you do anything by accident. We believe that this has been ordained by you. We pray that we have fulfilled the mission, the reason that you have sent us here and called us here. We thank you for the pastor and his wife of this church who has a heart for people, who has a heart to reach people from all people groups and different backgrounds and different class and different cultures. We pray that you will give the heart of the pastor, which is really the heart of God, to the people that he shepherds. That as he leads them and guides them in this direction, that they will come alongside and that they will become ambassadors of Christ, fishers of men, disciple makers. From whomsoever you decide to save and send. Bless this church. Strengthen it. Put a hedge of protection around it. Keep Satan and his demonic demons out of it. 
Unify their hearts in a way that they've never experienced before. And may your grace and your mercy and your glory be seen in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let every heart say, amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.